Hi, everyone. We're back. And by we are back means Jason and me, right? Dab Scout. We're here again. I wasn't here last week. Uh, my 13-week Iron Man streak, Cal Ripken-esque, as all, all the newspapers were calling it, um, ended last week. And then Jason wasn't here the week before. And frankly, we just, we saw the viewership, you know, they, they, they DM'd us, they sent out all types of charity endorsements. They even did a GoFundMe and we, we felt the love and we made sure that we were back together. So Jason, glad to be back. How about you? Absolutely. It feels good. I, I felt weird. It's almost like, uh, like cheating or something, you know, it just felt weird, uh, you know, not being together and doing the, with the waiver wire every week. So it's good to be back. Well, it's not like cheating, Jason. It it is cheating. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we're in a we're in a relationship, buddy, and just uh, yeah. get over it, okay? Yeah. Um, so, anyways, um, JP Damon, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Dap Scout, and then Jason Beckner, my amazing counterpart here that has to laugh at my jokes. It's in his contract. You can follow him on Twitter at JR Bex. And we're here to give you the waiver wire breakout. Now, if you've never watched the show before, the first thing we do is hit you over the head with somebody that we've previewed previously and talked about. And we just can't understand why they're under owned. We try to really target people that are under 50%. So if you don't see like a Julio Rodriguez or something like that, shout out to Joe Bond, our boss, who was really upset with some of the names here. He's like, I can't believe you guys haven't picked bigger names. Well, it's because. We're trying to, how do we put this? Dig deeper, but also the fact is that it's kind of ugly right now. 100% honest. <laughs> the waiver wire in some of these deeper leagues, it's not pretty. And you're going for some people that you probably told yourself a couple of years ago, I will never, ever roster this player again. So you're going to have to take some bad with some good. And we're going to try our best to let you know which ones you should just try to ride the hot streak and which ones you should definitely roster and we'll start that off with somebody you should definitely roster because, frankly, I don't understand how he's not universally owned. Michael Garcia is just going off. And it's not just a hot streak. He's just been doing this nonstop. Uh, so Jordan Foote, uh, Foote noted, and as you know, I like to tag people on Twitter that are uh, you know helping us out with some of these amazing uh, notes but Jordan puts Michael Garcia is slashing 296, 347, 403 with a 106 WRC plus. Now, again, anything above 100 is really good. Uh, since the calendar flipped to June, he's hitting 321 and striking out less than 20% of the time. And he's currently, and this is the really key part here, fourth among all rookies in F war. Now, if you think about all the rookies out there right now, right, uh, the Corbin Carroll, I know he's hurt, but you know all those rookies out there in the heralded Orioles class, he's ranked fourth right now. <laughs> That's not only amazing, but the fact that he's just flying under the radar is crazy to me. Also, just one last no note there, um, all while being 99th percentile and outs above average. So again, he's not just striking out, uh, doing anything you know absurdly crazy here. He's... <laughs> He's just doing great things with the bat. So overall lines, right? His walk percentage is about 8%. His strikeout percentage is 23% as of right now. Um, and his batting average of balls and plays about 367. That's not absurd. So it's not like it's going to just suddenly crater here shortly. And he's doing it all. I mean, stolen bases, 14. He's, uh, you know, hitting people in with 21. And this is already at 200 plus plate appearances. So again, it's not like, we're going to see a massive adjustment. I'm, we're always going to see adjustments in baseball, as we all know. But this is somebody who I think is definitely built long-term to stay in a, in a lineup that's got a lot of holes. Uh, and he had also did this in the minors as well, right? In the minors, he had 112 plate appearances this year. He had 17 RBIs uh, with 11 runs scored and then four stolen bases. But the key here is 14 uh, with walk percentage and 19 uh, K rate. So again, Really high walks, really high K. He's being selective. And frankly, if you just search for him on Twitter, all you see is just <laughs> exclamation marks uh, everywhere about, you know, his look at how many, you know, look, he hit a home run or he um, did something with his glove. And it just seems like just all positive news. Unless, Jason, you know something negative, I'm, I'm trying to understand why people don't own him everywhere. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with you. I don't know why. I mean, he's, on the Royals, the playing time's there. 
Right. Uh, you know, and in the last two weeks, he's really kind of shown out here and he's kind of come into his own here. He's, you know, four stolen bases and six runs scored in the last two weeks. He's reached base safely in eight straight games now. Um, he's included, that's including four multi hit games, which, and including a game where he went four for five. Um, wow. Multiple position eligible. So you, you can move him around in your lineup if you're a daily lineup or yeah, a That's a great point. Great point. Yeah, he's still only owned in 30% of the leagues. So I'm not sure why he's available in 70% of the leagues out there. Um, he was a you know top prospect for the for the Royals, so he's got some you know they want to see what they got in him. They're going to put him out there and ride those youngsters. And I don't I don't get it. He definitely needs to be owned. And, and if anything, just stash him on your bench or ride him while he's hot. You know. Yeah, and the left side of the infield seems to be a place where you either have one of the top guys or mm-hmm. you drafted a top guy and he's not doing. Uh, as well as he should, Arenado. Uh, but, um, you know, this is something that you know, I, he could fit in almost every lineup. I, I just don't see how uh, he should be sitting out there. And if he is, pick him up. That, that's yep. all I got to say. Just pick him up and find a place. DH him, whatever. <laughs> Put him in there. He's going to be playing every day. So going from a somewhat heralded prospect, I mean, heralded in the sense he was in the top 10, you know, Royals farm, to somebody who everybody should know his name that follows any dynasty or any prospects, Colton Kowser. I mean, another Orioles prospect. <laughs> I mean, the thing that cracks me up is that you see all the players that they've graduated. I think they still have another five players in the top 100 MLB uh, you know, prospect list. I, it is crazy the turnaround that has occurred there over the last couple of years. They've really built it from the ground up, and it's not just trades and things of that nature. This is great drafting. Uh, and, and a great farm system, which we all know is, you know, keys to any kind of long-term build, unless you have like Yankees payroll. But then we also see what happens when people use the Yankees payroll, like the Mets, you can build a crappy team. <laughs> so, you know, so Colton Kowser, uh, here's a funny story uh, from him. And this is uh, here on a Gersh online um, at Gersh online uh, on Twitter. Funny story about Orioles prospect Colton Kowser, who is making his MLB debut today. So this is back uh, three days ago. He had to borrow pants and shoes from his best friend on the team. Jason, let me see if you know this best friend on his team, Gunnar Henderson. So another thing just to kind of point out here, right? All these rookies that are coming up, all these prospects coming up, they've been playing together in this farm system because another great thing about homegrown talent, right? They have to play together and they're comfortable. They're friends. They were roommates, all these things. So that's great to see. But anyway, so he borrowed pants and shoes from his best friend because he did not have enough clothes with him when he got called up to the big leagues. I mean, it's one of those kind of kooky stories, but I think it also kind of ingratiates yourself to, you know, the fact that these are kids, right? We're talking about a guy who's 23 years old um, and he just got called up to the big leagues and his friends are there, right? I mean, what better thing to do? He was already having a great season in AAA. Like he didn't have one, you know, uh, kind of last year where he only played 27 games last year, uh, hit five home runs. He struck out 30% of the time, which isn't great, but you know, he had just gotten AAA. This year in AAA, uh, in the 56 games he played, it's about 250 plate appearances, 10 home runs, 54 runs scored, 40 RBIs, and seven stolen bases. I mean, so he's not just power, right? He's got some speed as well. And here's the best part. 18.7 walk and 23.3 Ks with an ISO of 207. So we're looking at a power hitter that absolutely knows what he needs to hit. I mean, that's why he's ranked as high as he is in some of these prospect rankings. Um, now, in the majors, you know, he's played three games. But this is what I love to see, right? He's got 14 plate appearances, three runs scored, one RBI, 21% walk percentage, zero strikeouts. Uh, and his ball, his batting average balls in play is like 200. So we know that's going to come up. We know, obviously, he's going to strike out. But... What I'm seeing is somebody who is absolutely ready to play and he's going to get comfortable in the clubhouse. It's not like he's going in with a bunch of 30 something veterans and he's going to feel super awkward. He's playing with his friends. In fact, there's a replay. If you catch it online that he actually called off a gunner and uh, one other player for a fly ball. And again, having somebody who is same age played with those other uh, players that are already up and is able to just call off, a, uh, call them off. You don't see that a lot, especially you know, in the sense of like, well, I need to give it up to the, the veteran or he needs to play. He was able to call them off and say, hey, uh, you know, that's my ball. It's not a huge play, but it just shows you kind of what they're building at the Orioles. And I just expect Kowser to just take off. Jason, what I miss? Not much. I mean, you nailed it on the head. This is like, a you know, this is the fifth overall pick in the 2021 class. 
um, moved quickly through that organization and that farm system here, making his debut in 2023. Um, really good power speed guy. And not only does he hit for power, but he also hits for a really high average. He's always hit for a high average, even going back to his you know minor league days and his college days. Um, you know, right now he's getting the opportunity with Austin Hayes out. And not only that, I think right now we're kind of seeing that shift within that Orioles organization. Like, hey, we're getting these young guys up. We're seeing what we got here, and they've been performing. So he can play all three outfield positions. So his bat, as long as his bat stays hot or, you know, from what he was doing at AAA, they're going to give him the opportunities. They're going to give him the playing time. Even when Hayes comes back, they'll shift them around. They'll give him some, you know, maybe go to left field, right field. Um, I I think this guy, you know, I think one thing that we just also should have mentioned that maybe the top of the episode, this is one of those weeks where, you know, we got the, we got the all-star break coming up, right? So yep. you could maybe catch some guys in your league off guard that may not be, you know, thinking about baseball or absolutely waiver wires. And you might be able to sneak a Colton Kowser in there and, and you know, grab when no one else is even thinking about him, because um, this is a guy that's going to be owned uh, probably pretty close to 100 percent after this week. Because um, you know, after making three three starts now, um, you know, he's going to start getting that name out there. So grab him now. Maybe you can sneak him by your your league mates this week with the with the All Star break. Absolutely, uh, I I love doing those little sneaky ones. Like uh, you know, when Wu was very close to being called up, I I yep. snuck him by in a couple leagues. And uh, I know he's going to have an innings cap, but I definitely, you know, love those kind of, you know, plays like that. And that's a great point, right? We're, we're in kind of a weird week to begin with. I mean, but we're already, you know, in the middle of the season, halfway through because the all-star break. Mm -hmm. And this is the time to kind of get the, you know, you have to make gambles to, to win. So talking about gambles and we had a real kind of funny conversation before this happened. And we're we're about to talk about a 35 year old Tommy Pham. Now the thing about Tommy Pham is he's he seems like he's no he's obviously been around for forever but you know I remember his time at Tampa Bay where he you know had 21 home runs and just seemed to be an all-star ready to happen and then he went to San Diego and I had to look it up because I wasn't sure because I was like I'm pretty sure this happened he got stabbed uh, during an altercation and that wasn't the best season or the best start in San Diego but now he's doing it on both sides of the ball. And in fact, one of the big things from yesterday's games is if you happen to uh, check out Twitter and, and this is on SNY TV, uh, Tommy Pham baited a uh, Hassong Kim into a base running blunder where Hassong Kim was trying to go for a triple and Tommy Pham is like, I'm going to just play with it, play with, play with the ball. And he, so Hassong Kim was ready at, at second and Tommy was kind of just holding onto the ball, doing this kind of, not juggling, but just kind of sitting there and he's at the wall. So all of a sudden Kim's like, Hey, I got the wheels. I'll beat him out. He throws an absolute seed. I mean, amazing throw to third base. Hassan Kim is out. Like, <laughs> and he, he, he looks like he's like, he's pointing at the bag or something. Like he had any chance. No, he's out by a mile. And I don't know if that's him pointing at the bag. Like how did that throw get there so fast? Or he just is, <laughs> I don't know. It just, it's, it's crazy to me. But yeah, Tommy Pham's getting it done. He looks incredibly uh, poised at the plate. And James Chanel, I know we've used him a bunch of times, but he has some great, uh, you know, call outs with stats. James Chanel says, Tommy Pham since May 28th. This is his NL rank. So on all of the uh, National League, right? 1.125 OPS. He's first. WRC plus. He's in first. Uh, uh, WOBA first. Uh, his batting average, 378. Second. On base percentage, 431. Third. And here's the best one. Slugging 694, and he's in first. So, of all the things happening with the Mets right now, uh, there is a silver lining, and that's Tommy Pham. The only thing that concerns me uh, would be, you know, he's going to get traded, and concern in the sense of where does he end up, right? Does he end up in a place where he's going to try to be, you know, in a bench role? Uh, he should be when somebody's this ridiculously hot, and he's doing well on every side he's never been a strikeout guy he's always been about 24 ish percent throughout his career he's at 21 percent right now k or eight uh 10 percent walks so this guy could do it again walk etc he's no slouch on the bases with 10 stolen bases and you know almost 10 home runs so nine home runs 25 runs uh scored and 34 rbis and this is in 67 games so i see somebody who should be playing every day his offensive war is ridiculous. It's 11.3 right now. Uh, his defense is negative. Uh, I'm not even going to mess with the defense because honestly, we play fantasy baseball. I don't care about defense. But, you know, definitely somebody who is 
just lighting it up. I, I don't know what, what, what to say. Maybe he, that year off helped him out. Um, uh, Jason, uh, other than the love that we saw, you know, back in 2019, where's Tommy Pham coming from? Because last year it didn't look like we had this guy uh, in San Diego. Yeah, it's crazy. I think he almost maybe, you know, made, you know, change of scenery, getting back to New York or something. I don't know. He he's really excelling since coming over to the Mets. You know, slash line across the board is just up. Um, is hitting for a way better average, way better on base. I mean, like I said, back to those like that 2019 season where, you know, in Tampa Bay where he went 2020. And actually, you know, he's he's been like a really, really good player for like especially deep leagues, four and five yeah. outfielders. Yep, absolutely. Um, in his past eight games, he's 14 for 31, which is basically a 452 batting average, two zone bases, two home runs. And if you look back at his career, when he, you know, he's had some down seasons and he's still right. at a 162 game average of basically 2020 season. Yep. So, and he looks to be pretty close to that pace right now. Just maybe a little bit shy in the stolen bases, but he knows he can have a great second half. Um, in the last 15 days, he's been a top 25 outfielder, um, and he's only owned in 30% of leagues. 70% of those leagues out there, which basically is probably your league, he is available, and he needs to be right. on your roster. Not just on your roster, in your starting lineup. Even right. in three even in three outfielder leagues, he should probably be in your lineup. And that's the thing. I mean, I think people see Mets, and they're like, oh, everything with the Mets sucks, or, you know, I only need to have these top-tier guys. Tommy Pham's doing it. It doesn't matter what what the jersey says, right? He's getting it done. And like you said, if you look at the longevity of this streak right now, it's not like a 10 game. It's a whole month, right? And plus, this is somebody who's just doing it right now. And I'm sure he's going to have a cold streak. Everybody does. But at the same time, in that time, you need to have him in your roster. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So this is... Something we don't typically talk about because I try to avoid two catcher leagues like the plague, like just like, you know, saves only leagues. Ugh. Uh, but we're talking about a catcher and Yenny or Diaz. I mean, how lucky are you if you're Dusty Baker? I mean, in the sense that, you know, you're kind of being forced to play him every day and you're going to have to find a place for him, even when your big, you know, bopper comes back when he you know when when the man for first base dh comes back from his from his injury they're gonna have to find a place for uh yanir diaz i picked him up a few weeks ago and i just thought it was gonna be a hot streak thing he's killing it in fact uh, this is this is great so uh dave morant dave morant uh t48 on twitter he has a fun fact this is a couple days ago but you can kind of get the gist of it Chaz mccormick who you should own. We've covered him before, but if you don't have him, please go pick him up. Chaz McCormick and Yenir Diaz are almost twins offensively. So Chaz has a 263 average, 341 on base, 481 slugging percentage, 822 OPS with eight homers. Yenir has three points higher on the average, uh, is 70 points less on the on base percentage. But when we go back to slugging percentage, he's six points higher. Uh, OPS, of course, is a little bit lower because of the on base percentage, but eight homers as well. You have if you have a player that's catcher eligible that's giving you outfield offense, run, don't walk to your waiver wires. Uh, yes, there is some concern that he might not play, uh, you know, or he might not get as many at bats when the Astros become fully healthy. But I'm seeing where they're moving him around, right? They, they've already played him three games at first. He's played a vast majority uh, of a catcher where he started 20 games and played 27 games. They're a catcher as well. And he's DH'd already um, quite a bit in the minors uh, where he played almost 14 games in the minors. So I, I have a feeling that the Astros are going to find a place for him. And honestly, why wouldn't you? With, with a bat this hot, it just makes no sense why you wouldn't. And this is somebody who's also been able to do this in the minors as well. Triple A last year, he had 16 bombs. And when doing all all the various different actions as well, and with only thirty nine strikeouts in forty eight games, that's two hundred at bats. That's phenomenal. So this year, you know, when, when we kind of break out what he's been doing in twenty twenty three, he's not walking. So OBP be darned, right? He's only two percent there, but he has eighteen point seven percent K rate, and when he's making contact, he's doing damage. Ten home runs. And only 50 games, so 182 plate appearances. 21 runs scored. I mean, sorry, 21 runs scored, yep, and 21 RBIs. 
for 509 slugging percentage right now. It just just doesn't get any better than that with a catcher, especially one that doesn't show you like it's going to be all or nothing. And he's shown that he can get walks with 5% uh, walk rate in AAA last year. And so he, it's not like I expect that to come up a little bit, but he's done it in 50 games so far, Jason. I, 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 this isn't a fluke. What do you think? Yeah, and he actually had a multi-home run game just this past week. So the power's for real. Yeah. Um, just want to take a quick minute and shout out Jesse Roach of Baseball's Prospectus. He kind of turned me on to this guy this offseason, was kind of touting him after that great 2022 year where he just said 16 home runs at AAA and then another uh, nine or sorry, yeah, nine in double A. So a total of 25 all last year in, in, in the minors. Um, in the past two weeks, he's been the, the number 12 catcher. And then this past week, he's been the top six catchers. I mean, not only two catcher leagues right now, but even single catcher leagues right now, right. you could be starting this guy. Um, the power is real. It's going to continue to DH, like you said earlier, while Alvarez is sidelined, which with that oblique, you never know how long that, that could be months and months of Yanir Diaz putting up these power numbers at the catcher position. Right. He, he needs to be owned in, in even single catcher, one catcher leagues. Um, I don't see, I don't see why he's this low, low owned. Obviously it's like, People don't know the name, right? So it's like a little right. bit of not not a good name recognition, but right. trust us, he will he will be putting up numbers for your fantasy team. And the great thing is, I I just think Dusty Baker has got to be smart enough to be like, you know what, we're gonna find a place to to bat this guy, even when Alvarez comes back, and you know we we get fully healthy in the infield, they're gonna find a place. I I just don't see how they couldn't. Agreed. All right, so Joe Bond, our boss. The founder of Fantasy Six Pack is going to hate the next name. I, we talked about this already. We're, our jobs are on the line here because he hates this name so much. But we don't care because we're here to deliver the truth. We're here to deliver yeah. advice to you to win your leagues. So if you don't see us here next week, <laughs> you know what happened. We, we we tried. We tried desperately to give you the right advice, and, and, and Joe tried to stifle us. But Seth Lugo, what an un... <sighs> How do I put this? Unexciting name, <laughs> Seth Lugo. I mean, we're talking about a 33 year old who has had fun ish times with the Mets. He started, didn't start any games the last two years. You know, he had 18 starts back in 2017. And his stat line looks kind of, yeah. But let's dive deeper. So, yeah, AJ Casavell. So AJ Casavell on Twitter. Yeah, in the game, he got hurt. Seth Lugo, right? Allowed five runs and two innings against the Royals. In his el- other 11 starts, he has a 277 average. So why was the injury a good thing for fantasy honors? Well, if you look at the San Diego Union Tribune, Seth Lugo had not thrown 100 innings in a season in five years and it already was at 41 and two thirds innings. Um, in his return return to the rotation before he got his right calf strain. So it wasn't an arm thing, wasn't a shoulder thing, an elbow, anything that kind of worries you about pitching, right? It was a right calf strain. So it really gave a chance to kind of, I wouldn't say reset, but definitely slow down his innings pitched. I am liking what I'm seeing here. Eight. 8.3 K case per nine, 1.8 walk per nine. And I, again, those numbers are a little inflated with that Royals, uh, you know, game that he got destroyed. But beyond that, again, if you look at his season long numbers, it's still pretty great. I mean, we're looking at somebody who's also doing 47% in ground balls, 75% left on base. So all numbers that don't, scream like regression because all of these are well within his normal career numbers. The only issue you might have, like we talked about is they're probably going to be an ending cap. I'd probably put it at 125, maybe 140, give or take of an innings cap. So he's not going to play all next year. I mean, next half of the season, he might become a bulk reliever, but before that happens, or he might be an opener before that happens, you should pick him up because these are some great underlying stats, especially like we just said, if you throw out that one bad game, he's been a pretty darn good pitcher. Jason, I know I don't sound terribly excited because it's Seth Lugo, who is, you know, a reliever for the Mets for, you know, off and on for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, t- tell us why Joe Bond should be quaking his boots for not picking him up. 
yeah, I mean, he's just one of the, like you said, one of those names. You're just like, oh, Seth Lugo, Seth Lugo again. No, man, I've, I've seen, I've heard his name for the last like two decades, it seems like. But since going over to the Padres, he's, you know, kind of been put into this starting role and he's, he's done a really well, good job of doing uh, as a starter. You know, right now he's relying less on that sinker and less on the slider. He's really been throwing that fastball curveball combo. And actually, the curveball has been really dominant for him this year. He's got like a 23% whiff rate on the curveball. Uh, the curveball spin is actually in the 99th percentile. For curveball spin um so i mean he's just been really hammering that curveball and actually that's his most relied on pitch is the curveball so i think you know someone got in his ear and said hey that curveball you got is really good just go out there and throw that curveball you know set them hitters up with the curveball and then hit him with the fastball um and even that changeup doesn't throw it often but it's been very effective when he does throw it he's got seven quality starts in his 12 starts this year um i mean if you're not going to quality start, you're, you know, the, obviously the Padres have been a little bit on the struggle bus as far as getting wins, but usually quality starts can somewhat correlate to wins. So even if you play in a win league and not a quality start league, which you shouldn't be doing, but if you play in a win league, there's a good chance he can give you some wins as well because he's getting quality starts and going deep in the deep into the, the game. So I, it's boring as it is. Grab Seth Lugo and start him um, and. And then just, especially against like bad teams, absolutely throw stuff to go out there in your lineups. Yeah. I, there's going to be roster turnover with the Mets. Uh, you, you can't be this expensive and keep the roster the way it is. Either they're going to go all in, which I don't see how they could. There hasn't been kind of a life there uh, that shows me a, a long streak. Like, you know, they're just one piece away. So it's going to be interesting what's going to happen with the Mets. But I think that Seth Lugo can stick in the rotation, at least until he hits that innings cap, whatever that innings cap might be. But again, I, I'd put it at 125, uh, 140, somewhere in that in that range. All right. So we talked pre-show about this. I told you that I was, we're going to talk about him. I'm not happy about it. But guess what, uh, viewers? We're at the part of the season that just go out and find pitchers. <laughs> you know, we've lost so many to injuries or so many that have now, you know, gone down for various reasons and they're going to be out for a while or right about the all-star break. And a lot of people get shut down. So they have a two week, you know, rest. So Graham Ashcraft, he plays for Cincinnati. So that's the first knock against him, right? Because we know, as we talked about a thousand times on this show, that Cincinnati's home park plays, even worse for pitchers than Colorado does now with the uh, humidor. So that's the first thing. So you almost can't start him all, all the time, especially at home, but we'll get there for a second here. I'll, I'll tell you some more about this wonderful guy, but you know, June 30th start, you know, his final line was 6.2 innings pitched one earned run, two walks, seven K's. And then, you know, on July 5th, six innings pitched, seven hits, one run, one earned run, three walks, and then two K's. So that's the problem with Graham Ashcraft. Um, so I just got that from Valley Sports uh, Cincinnati on, on both those. Because somebody who should be striking out a lot more has some of the most inconsistent strikeout numbers I think I've ever seen for somebody who is his size. Uh, you know, I, we're talking about somebody who's 6'2", 240. So he's not a small person. He's 24 years old. So, I mean, 25 years old. So he's not like he's old and he's definitely, you know, thrown some gems like we just talked about, but littered throughout there, he gave up 10 earned runs to Milwaukee and that wasn't at home. I'm sorry. That, that was at home, but at, you know, also away, uh, you know, he's given up uh, quite a bit. So it's one of those things where I definitely want to tell you don't start him at home, but then, you know, on the 30th against San Diego, he only gave a one earned run. And then at Washington, he gave a one earned run. But then San Diego, he strikes out seven. And then it gets Washington, who you think you'd feast on, two strikeouts. Mm -hmm. it, uh, he just seems like somebody, well, I owned him in uh, quite a few leagues last year. And frankly, after the offseason hype, I was like, I wasn't so happy to send him away to other teams. I got one heck of a prospect call on, on a couple of trades. Because I saw this inconsistency last year. So it's not the first year he's doing this where he's up, down, up, down, strikeouts in case. If he was striking out a bunch of people and you know giving up five, six runs, I can find a place for you. But if you're doing two strikeouts and six earned runs and you know seven strikeouts, 
I don't know what to do there, even on daily lineups. So, Jason, like I said before the show, you're going to have to talk them up because I can't. I mean, you pretty much nail a lot of it on the head. It's just he's inconsistent. He's what Nick Pollock Pitchos calls a cherry bomb, right? He sprinkles yep. in these great uh, pitching starts where you're like, oh, man, is Ashcraft back? And then the next time you roll him out there, it's 10 earned at home to Milwaukee. Um, but he does have some nice things that, you know, does get that's why he gets those nice starts. He's had since coming off the L I L, he did have a little bit of a uh, a bad start. But then those last two, like you said, on the 30th and the last one, he's got back to back quality starts. Definitely need to see more strikeouts. Because again, there's sometimes I think I was watching the game the other day in the two strikeout game. He was like the fifth inning. He hadn't even had a strikeout yet. And on top of that, he walks guys too. Um the problem with him too is he throws a cut fastball. So like you don't you don't really have a ton of control with the cut, cut fastball. You know, it's like it lives on the edges of the zone. So, he, you know, if you, you got an umpire that's, you know, pinch, pinching the, the strike zone, you're going to limit – you're not going to limit those walks. Um, but if you look at some of the underlying stats, he has actually pitched better than he, his ERA su- suggests. So both his ex-ERA, FIP, and ex-FIP are all lower than his ERA right now. Um, but, again, he only throws two pitches. That's always worrisome as well. Basically relies just on that cut fastball um, and the curveball, and 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 a lot of times because of a lot of the home runs too. The home runs that also could be a product of Great American Ballpark, right? It's now been, of course, I think, yeah. dethroned Colorado as the most home run friendly park in all of baseball. So yep. again, a lot of that home run rate and that fly ball to home run rate could be a product of Great American Ballpark, but. Uh, it, it's hard to say with him. I, I I start him in a lot of leagues and just pray that, that day that <laughs> he doesn't cherry bomb on you because he is right. he is one of those guys where it's sink or swim with him. But um, I think you know in deeper leagues he should actually absolutely be rostered more than eleven percent and even started in more than that. So that's where yeah, I'm at, with Graham, Graham Ashcraft. It's it's I agree. It's one of those things where it's like. I am at this point with my roster that I need to grab some players, but I'm not happy about it. Uh, and you just hope you get the right week because w- when he's, when he's on, he's on, but I think mm-hmm. he's just got stuff that if it, if it's too straight, if it's not spinning, right, it's yeah. going over the fence and especially at the great American ballpark. Yeah. Well, and real quick. Right. I know what we talked about no, sure. you know, him, his last start. We did get rocked by the Milwaukee. His next start comes against Milwaukee. So, <laughs> Just fade that into caution. I mean, if you're thinking about picking him up and starting him in his next start, he'll, he'll he will face Milwaukee um, at home. It's a home and home, so I believe uh. it'll be at home. Um, they go to Milwaukee to start the uh, after uh, to end the All Star break, and then right when they come back from the All Star break, it's home against Milwaukee. So, yeah, so I would definitely skip that start for all intents and purposes, at least from for me. Yes, but if you if you absolutely need the innings pitch, then you know. You're not you're not worried about our advice, anyways. The ultra break does give the Cincinnati Reds a, a moment to realign their uh, starting rotation, so True. it's possible that he could face the Giants. But both of them are, are at home, so Ugh. just be caution with that. Yeah, try to try to avoid that at yeah. all costs. Uh, well, I can't thank you enough for watching. If you've made it all the way to this end, thank you so much for watching. Uh, Jason and I will definitely try to be here next week uh, while we make two weeks in a row of us hanging out together. If you have any questions, please uh, reach us out on Twitter and make sure to just follow some advice here, especially with the need to always update your rosters. Don't sit idle. Always try to add somebody else to your bench, if nothing else, because you just never know when that injury bug is going to happen. And so we thank you so much for watching from Fancy Six Pack. Thanks so much. See ya.